Stephen next explains why every habit is a paradigm shift, representing a break from traditional wisdom and culture. He also explains the relationship the seven habits have to each other, and how the habits apply to both individuals and organizations. Now we move to the third part, which will be a short part, in reviewing all that we have covered and to put it in the larger context of paradigms. I suggest, my friends, my listeners, that every habit is a paradigm shift. Let me show you. Take how we define, first of all, effectiveness as the PPC balance. See, most people define success almost entirely focused upon P, getting the golden eggs. So that itself is a paradigm shift. Habit number one, be proactive. The traditional popular paradigm is you're not responsible. You're a product. You're a program. Habit two, begin with the end in mind. The traditional paradigm is that you're acting out of the scripts given to you, that you're really not in charge, and that goal setting is useful and helpful, but usually not resulting in great accomplishments because of all of the other forces that play upon your life and keep you from accomplishing those goals. Habit number three, put first things first. You'll find that most people are surrounding the paradigm of quadrant one. They're always prioritizing into checklists the crises and the problems of their life. That is an action paradigm they're into, whether they believe it or not. Throw away simple calendars, throw away appointment books, and instead write your mission, your roles and goals, have a long-term appointment calendar where you can on a weekly basis transfer that information and how are you going to accomplish those goals in each of the roles to a weekly thing and then have the mental toughness and the discipline to stay with it unless a more important thing like a person's need supersedes. Habit four, think win-win, is so deeply counter to the win-lose scripting programming of most people's lives. Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood, is the opposite of the tendency which is so strong in us of seeking first to be understood. And habit six is usually defined as compromise. Very few people have experienced what synergy is really like. It's a whole new world. It's a world of adventure, excitement, creativity, new options, new opportunities, whole new ways of thinking are manifested in that habit. Just as Einstein put it, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. Let's look now at habit seven. It itself is a paradigm shift. You know what the normal operational paradigm that exists out there? First of all, it's not balanced. It doesn't focus on all four dimensions. It may focus only on the physical one, so people are into exercise, or perhaps on the mental one, so they become readers of books, or it may focus only on the spiritual one, so people withdraw into the wilderness in deep meditation. The key is balance between all four dimensions, and that is the paradigm we are advocating here. A balanced one, also one that requires constant attention, I mean daily attention, to all four dimensions. Second, I'd like to emphasize the sequential nature of these habits. How one, two, three, or what I call the private victory, the character victory, leads to four, five, six, the public victory, the personality victory. And to not confuse or to invert that process. It will not take place that way any more than you can harvest crops you have not sown. Even inside each group of habits, you must have a sense of personal awareness, personal vision, habit one, before you'll even attempt to provide leadership and management, habits two and three. You must have a desire to go for win-win before you'd even want to listen and to communicate and to go for synergy in habits four and five. Third, I suggest that the synergy or the relationship between the habits is the power of the seven habits. It's the way they serve each other. See, I have to be very proactive before I can seek first to understand. I have to be very proactive before I'll work on quadrant two. I have to have a real sense of mission, habit two, before I would be able to know exactly what kind of a win-win agreement would be a win for me. Fourth, I suggest all of these habits apply to organizations as much as to individuals. We work with literally hundreds of organizations all over the country. And organizations that are highly proactive are making their own futures happen. For instance, a while back, I was in a three-day conference 
of an association of businesses that were undergoing some very serious setbacks in the industry, including massive unemployment. They were very depressed and blue. The very first day of the conference, they focused on what was happening to them, and they were depressed. The second day, they focused on the future trends. They were more depressed. Things were going to go worse, not better. The third day, they focused on the proactive question. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to better manage and control our costs and increase our revenues? And they gave their creative energies to that. At the end of the three-day conference, we came up with a kind of brief verbal motto that symbolized that three days. Someone comes up and says, how's business? The answer is given in three parts. Part one, what's happening to us is not good, and the trend suggests it will get worse before it gets better. Part two, but what we are causing to happen is very good, for we are better managing our costs and increasing our revenues. Part three, therefore, my friend, business is better than ever. That's the proactive response of a business that is in charge of its own destiny in a relatively hostile environment. How does a business do habit too? It develops a mission statement, a purpose statement, a value system that everybody is involved in its formation. What's habit three? It lives accordingly. It uses that as the criteria by which everything else is evaluated. What's habit four? In all of its relationships, it thinks win-win. Mutual benefit, suppliers, employees, owners, managers, the public. Of course it takes social responsibility. It doesn't need to get into collective resistance, <coughs> different forms of social legislation to force people to do what is right. As Patrick Henry once said, he that does not govern himself wisely will be governed by despots. The greatest way to lose our liberties is to exercise our freedom irresponsibly. What's habit five to a business? Understand the customer. Understand first before you design products, before you sell services. Understand. Understand your people, your employees, before you know how to organize the culture, to try to influence the culture. Then seek to be understood. Then seek to have influence. Diagnose before you prescribe. And what's habit six? Synergize. Get deeply involved with your customers and understanding their needs. Come up with creative new solutions. And if you help produce it with them, they're highly influenceable by you. In fact, it will test your professional integrity because they'll do about anything you tell them to. Just like someone who had confidence in their doctor would do anything the doctor told them to do. And what is the self-renewal habit, the sharpening the saw habit of organizations? What does an organization do to renew itself? It has to rethink all of its operations against the higher criteria of change out there in the environment and of the mission statement so that the spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation is kept alive. It has to fundamentally ask this question. If we did not have this practice, if we did not have this policy, if we did not have this product, would we adopt it today? That takes courage. And to move away completely from the expression, that's the way we've always done it. Next time someone says that, ostracize them and haunt them for 48 hours. <laughs> In other words, my friends, these are habits of life for people and organizations. They are the embodiment of principles, natural laws, that will hold over time for people and organizations. A principle is a natural law. A practice is its expression in a particular circumstance. For instance, let's say that you have the principle of serving the customer well. A practice may be to listen carefully to what the customer wants and give him that particular thing. But in another situation, you don't have access to knowing what the customer wants. So you may have to do some research to understand generic needs out there of customers and then adapt to that. The point is that any time you work with principles, you work with natural laws, but they express themselves in a number of different ways in different circumstances. For instance, you may be in a situation where the natural law that is operating is to treat this particular employee with great courtesy and respect. But let's say the situation is such that that employee is violating the value system of the organization. Maybe the most respectful way you can deal with that employee is to carry out the agreed upon consequence of his losing his job or being transferred to a lower position because you operate on the principle of helping people and you're helping that person learn accountability where other people may have let him off the hook in the name of being a nice guy but really ends up with lose win the key is to gear our life around principles and then let everybody sense from their conscience what the appropriate practices are in different situations. 
If you teach people practices, you make them dependent. You say to a new employee, do this, do this, do this. Now what happens when the change comes? They're looking to you again. They're dependent upon you. There's no PC in it. You give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Teach principles and let people govern themselves in selecting the practices. Arnold Toynbee, the great historian, says that the whole history of mankind's institutions and societies themselves can be summarized in a simple little formula. Challenge, response. The challenge is external, the response is internal, it comes back. If the response is equal to the challenge, it is success. If the response is obsolete because of a new change, even though it once applied and once worked, it will lead to failure. Nothing fails like success. You ever tried to raise child number two like you did child number one and wonder why it didn't work? You have a totally different challenge. That's why if you operate on principles, not practices, the principles will always stay no matter what the circumstance is but the practices will vary all over the place. What happens with organizations is, if they are not grounded into a changeless set of core values and a mission statement that tells what they're about, you'll find that they will tend to rigidify and freeze systems and structures that become obsolete. But once worked, old procedures, old policy manuals, people live in memo haven, they're inundated by old things that are now totally obsolete. The key is to get the entire culture around a mission statement and a set of values. Then you don't have to supervise them. They supervise themselves. It's moving from the paradigm of control to the paradigm of commitment and release. Fifth, let's be patient and practice. As one put it, let's not keep pulling up the flowers to see how the roots are coming. It takes patience because we're in the law of the harvest. We're into natural laws. It's important that we realize we don't have to be perfect in habits one, two, and three before we can go to work on habits four, five, and six. We're working every day on habits four, five, and six. All I suggest is we will not be truly effective with habits four, five, and six unless we achieve a little higher degree of self-mastery and internal security, which are the fruits of habits one, two, and three. Particularly, let's get more and more into quadrant two where all these seven habits live. Spend time there. If you're only there 10%, get there 15, then 20, then 30. Watch what begins to happen to quadrant one. Watch what begins to happen to your level of excitement, to the quality of your relationships, and to your self-confidence, and the spirit of adventure and excitement and happiness that were the promised results that we indicated we could expect if we truly learned, taught, and applied these habits. Regarding this process of living out of Quadrant 2, there is an outstanding book called Connections, written by Roger and Becky Merrill, that would give a great deal of specific, helpful direction, ideas, on how to realistically live in Quadrant 2, how to use time tools well so that they serve you well, and also a great deal of useful information and motivation on how to write a mission statement a statement of purpose and philosophy and values. 